Right, great. Um, so yeah, a little quick talk about how my team sort of, I don't know, transitioned into the freeway, so to speak. Um, real quick, um, I'm a senior principal engineer at Comcast. Um, I have the, what I like to call the unique pleasure of taking things that I learn at conferences like this and, and from blogs and everything else and uh, trying to understand it myself and see how we can apply it and bring it back to the team and teach the team and, um, and bring them up for, uh, to the same you know, levels. Um, <clears throat> so about, oh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, we started working on a portal for, for the project that, that I was tech lead for. And um, we really, we were struggling a lot with the, the code. We were using play um, and in our actions. Every action was composed of uh, very coupled code, like dealing with futures and handling errors and things that weren't actually the business logic of the, of the code. And it got more and more frustrating. And, and, and the developers were really not very happy to even have to work in the code. Um, onboarding new people was more difficult because uh, the code was hard to you know, follow and understand. And it was hard to even pull out abstractions that you could reasonably reuse. And so things were done slightly differently in every single method. And uh, it was a real pain. Uh, so I came in, and, and actually one of the developers came to me and said, hey, what about the free monad? Is this something that we could use here? And, and I said, yes, I hope so, because I've wanted to use it since I first learned about it, uh, but hadn't really uh, found a good place to put it yet. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into the full depths because it gets plenty of attention. Um, but, you know, the free monad would let us capture the structure of our computation. Uh, we could walk over it, interpret it to change that data into actions, and then we can use different interpretations testing in production. Um, so that's, you know, that's great. That's what we want. Um, we can use cats. We can build simple data types describing our computation. Uh, we can combine those types with coproduct. We can build simple interpreters and combine those interpreters. That's easy, right? But we kind of got stuck. How do we do this? Um, the the theory is great, um, and you know, so we watched Runar's talk, and we watched uh, Raul Raja's functional programming patterns, which gave us some you know idea of how to structure the code. The, the biggest problems with the talks that were out there is most of the examples are toy examples. And, and there's a good reason you're not going to do a code review uh, in the middle of a conference talk, or I hope not. Um, and there's, so there are very few practical examples that applied to our problems. So what did we do? Uh, we actually started by, you know, several people went off in completely different directions and tried to do free. And they had different ideas of what it meant. and, and we had still problems. Uh, so I sat everyone down and I said, let's just start from scratch. We, we took, the sim took one action, one thing that we wanted to do in the code. Uh, we built up exactly the code that we wanted to see. Um, and as we did it, we added or expanded our algebras as needed to cover the cases that we, sorry, that we were actually encountering in the code. Um, as part of this, you know, so we started with the algebras and I said, hey, here's some code. And then, of course, the immediate next response was, okay, well, what does that do, right? It doesn't do anything yet. Uh, so I said, all right, let's make the simplest possible interpreters. Uh, so we made synchronous, in-memory interpreters, uh, mock interpreters, if you want, something we could use in testing but couldn't really use in our production code. And then as we went, we replaced them once we were ready. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we, once we had these interpreters working, we could show that the the code did what we wanted, we could actually take it and, and slowly replace it with, you know, code that uses futures and actually calls the database and things like that. So we did build, as part of this, we built a common action implementation for, uh, for play that wrapped play's action, essentially, so that we could have the code of our actions would actually be free monads. It would just, a for comprehension returns a free monad, and actually produces the, um, inside that wrapper, we would actually interpret the free using our interpreters. Um, so all of our controllers methods simply be built free structures, which is exactly, you know, the pretty code that we wanted to see that didn't deal with a lot of the plumbing. So how did we design an algebra? Um, we considered exactly the code that we wanted to see. What were the inputs we wanted? What were the outputs that we wanted? 
Um, are there any complexities that should be hidden um, or could be hidden? So I wanted the code to be as clean as possible with no distractions at all when you read the business code. Um, and that included, you know, concurrent modifications. I had a big, you know, we had a very long discussion around, hey, I need to check my database with the CAS values. And I was like, hide all that. You know, that shouldn't be dealt with at the action methods. We should be doing that inside interpreters if, as much as we can. Uh, providing access to the play request. We wanted to hide that if we could. Because uh, not everything needed it and it was cluttering up all the code. Uh, we could hide other complexities like retries. Uh, and I'm not, we didn't really use that, but it's definitely in the list of things that, that I wanted to be able to do. Uh, so interpreters. All of our interpreters must produce the same output monad. Uh, right, so we use some functional abstractions. Uh, monad error is a big one. Um, so that we can handle errors inside of our <coughs> interpreters. Um, and then, you know, implement one interpreter that applies to many monads. So the, the best thing here, we wanted to build interpreters so that if you didn't care if it was in the future, then don't write your interpreter to future. Write your interpreter to monad error, because then you cover a lot of different cases with one interpreter. Also, consider Clisley or state T for computation. Uh, so this was a bit, ha, excuse me. This was a big one. Um, it's useful for passing data or state through to your interpreted code. Um, those values don't need to be passed through the algebra, um, through your actual business logic. You can capture it all underneath and pass it up through that way. <clears throat> And then build interpreters with the bare minimum output monad. So if an interpreter doesn't need to worry about the request from play, don't build it with a Clisley that worries about the request to play. Um, this is a big one that, that's come up even more recently. Um, you want to be able to combine, um, provide lifting transformations so that you combine the interpreters at the point when you build your, you know, for, for my nine algebras, I want one interpreter. Combine them there. Don't worry about building the interpreters with that knowledge already in place. That way your interpreters are more flexible and useful. Yes. Yes. I believe. <laughs> All right. Um, so individual interpreters can then be protected from the changes to the output monad, uh, which is important to code reuse. So a lot of people talk about, you know, how great it is to combine things um, for your business logic, but this is also allows you to isolate the, uh, the, the interpreters from changes and build more useful and reusable interpreters. So what do you need? Um, we used the CATS library, most of our free support. Uh, co-product, natural transformations, um, and provides all the useful functional abstract oh, I'm sorry, it went too far. All right. Here we go. Um, Clisley, Monad Error, all of our useful stuff. Um, kind projector was critical. Um, you know, type lambdas are scary, and kind projector removes that scariness from your code. Um, I can write a type type lambda, not everyone in my team can. Um, and then, you know, we were in Scala 2.11, so the SI2712 fix was very important for us. Um, if you don't have it, you should be using something that gets it for you. Um, so a little bit of code, uh, so that it's not all just type of slides for you. Um, this is my shot at a retry uh, interpreter. So it takes any interpreter from F to M uh, and then a function to determine should I retry this or how many times should I retry this. And M has to be a monad error. And then we apply the, um, you know, we write our apply method as we want. We, you know, write a helper function. So we're going to attempt 
for some number of attempts, our, our monad, and we will handle our errors with, we'll make a call to the interpreter, producing our monad. If we get an error, we'll actually try our function, determine if we have to retry, and if we do, we'll just loop, right? And then we just start that, that function going, and we can now retry errors on any monad. So any interpretations to future, we could retry error on, for example. <clears throat> That's the full slide, nice. Um, so then the other thing we wanna do when we use interpreters, we wanna do things like, I just wanna write to future. I don't care about requests, so I don't wanna write to Clisely if I don't have to. And so providing these lifting transformations that lift uh, an interpreter to a Clisely. Um, and that's, you know, very simple. So we want to just take in the, the algebra, run it through, um, wrap up the, <coughs> sorry, when we take it in, we want to just wrap the, the output monad. So this is actually taking the output monad and, and wrapping it uh, post. And so we just ignore the input argument, return the, the monad as is, simple. So, are we done? Um, our codes become cleaner and easier to understand. Uh, it's easy and pleasant to add new endpoints. Uh, we've onboarded new engineers that were less experienced with Scala, came from other teams, and they've picked it up very quickly and, and, and gotten into writing in the code, which I consider probably the greatest success. Um, I'd say we aren't done. We're still driving for better, cleaner code organization. We're still learning how to build power into our interpreters. Uh, and then we wanna sp spread the knowledge, uh, get that more teams using this, uh, more teams trying it out and gaining experience, so. Uh, so ultimately, I started after writing this and, and talking about this at work, you know, write the code that you wanna see and then make it work. That's big, my biggest thing. The free monad is one tool to do that. Um, there's some initial ramp up as you figure out how it's gonna work for you, um, but it's ultimately very rewarding. So find an approach that works for your team. And that's it. I went for <clears throat> exactly the calls that I thought were needed. So based on, what was already there or? Uh, based on exactly what we wanted to do. If we want to read a value from the database, there should be some read from database call, right? If um, I'm trying to think of specific examples. Um, we did, you know, just simple ones like errors. If you want an error, then it just, that's your only step in the, in the whole algebra. So you break it down into the simplest steps and then make sure that the code you want to see is what you're writing. If you're adding steps and making calls that you don't actually want to see in the code, then they should probably be wrapped up into a single call. So. Yes. Um, maybe. <laughs> I didn't try to write it that way. It does allow you to interpret the error every time. So you could write something into that error function that actually takes the exception and makes a different decision as to how many retries to do. I believe, I haven't, uh, it was a while since I wrote that, let's see. Um, yeah, we call it, for every time we get the error, we'll call the, the retries function again. So building maybe a little more state in there would let you do your, your back offs better, so. Yes. Right. Uh, testing interpreters was probably the trickier one because we still like sort of dive into the realm possibly of mocks and things like that. 
um, but also simpler because you've broken the steps down so that they don't actually do a lot per step. So you can test each step individually um, fairly cleanly. Uh, for We had built up a lot of mock interpreters as we built this, and we were able to use those to do a lot of testing. Um, they had all the functionality that we needed in order to complete tests by just putting all the mocks together into one interpreter and then interpreting the free code over that. So. I, I haven't done a lot of, you know, actual investigation of that. Uh, we didn't have any problems. The biggest thing that, that we saw is we were using, you know, Deuce to combine our controllers, and we had issues where we, if we, they weren't singletons, we were taking a lot longer because we were generating uh, more information every time. Once I sort of said, hey, these are singletons, the performance went way up really quickly, so. Yes. No, we never really had to do that. There was an attempt with the, with the CAS values to expose those values out through the algebra, and I pushed really hard to hide that, you know, I said, we can solve this with state T, we can, you know, store the CASs in a map if we have to, and, and hide it all from the code, so. That's not something that came up in our code. I have seen that in freestyle, for example. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, my one regret of freestyle is that it doesn't offer the just plain free option. Um, so, yeah. We actually never went to the point of actually implementing the CASs, but I pushed it at the portal that we were building was going to be such low use that I was like, if we get the occasional weird behavior because we're overwriting, it's not going to be a problem. Um, and if it does become a problem, we can push it later. Uh, so that was one reason to keep it out of the language was to sort of say, like, we can worry about this concern later. So. All right. No more questions? Let's thank, let's thank Dave and give him another round of applause.